Okay, so this will be the first lecture out of chapter six. So chapter six covers this concept of thermochemistry. So what is thermochemistry? So it's basically just the study of heat changes in a reaction or a, or a process. Um, so if we're looking at heat changes in a process, so heat basically it's associated with energy. And so the SI unit of energy is what's known as the joule. So where a joule is defined um, in the SI base units, so a joule is a kilogram meter squared per second squared. So it's kind of an abstract unit of energy. Uh, so a more commonly known unit of energy is what's known as, of course, the calorie. So one calorie is equal to 4.184 joules. So one thing that you have to do in this chapter all the time is convert between calories and joules, and that's your conversion factor. <clears throat> okay, so what do I mean by a process? So a so we're going to look at heat changes in processes or heat changes in chemical reactions. So this would be an example of a process. So if you have ice, H2O solid, so ice, and it melts to make H2O liquid, uh, so that would be a phase change, so that's a process. Um, <clears throat> okay, so we go from a block of ice to a puddle of water. So is heat given off or absorbed in this process? <clears throat> Uh, so this would be one thing that you have to be careful of in this chapter. <clears throat> so it depends on what I'm referring to. If I'm referring to the ice to melt it, it must absorb energy. Um, so with respect to the ice, then it would be absorbing energy. <clears throat> uh, but where does that energy come from? Well, it comes from everything in the vicinity of the block of ice. So it would come from the surface that it sets on, uh, the, the air molecules that are around it, uh, any electromagnetic ra radiation uh, source. Um, <clears throat> so the block of ice uh, to melt, it must absorb energy, but that energy comes from this surface that it sets on, the air molecules, and those must lose energy. So is energy absorbed or lost in this process depends on what I'm talking about, right? If I'm talking about the ice or if I'm talking about what surrounds the ice. So in, in thermochemistry, you have to be very specific to what you're referring to. So in this case, the block of ice would be what's referred to as the system. So that's what's under study and everything in the vicinity of the system. Uh, so whatever can feed energy into the system or whatever kind of can absorb energy from the system is what's known as the surroundings. <clears throat> so the surface that this ice cube sets on, the air around it is the surroundings. <clears throat> so in thermochemistry, then you always have to be aware there's a system and there's a surroundings. One thing can absorb energy, which means the other thing must be releasing energy or vice versa. <clears throat> okay. Um, so the ice cube absorbs energy. So with respect to the ice cube, the process is said to be endothermic. So a process or reaction that absorbs energy is said to always be endothermic. <clears throat> uh, but the surface, the air molecules lose energy. So with respect to the surroundings, the process is exothermic. So a process that gives off energy is said to be exothermic. <clears throat> Okay, so heat change for a process is given the symbol Q. For a chemical reaction, heat change is called enthalpy and it's given the symbol H. So if heat is absorbed, Q or H is positive, so positive Q, positive H. Or if heat is given off in a reaction, uh, Q or H is negative. So if it's endothermic, it's positive H, positive Q. If it's exothermic, it's negative Q or negative H. Okay, so for this process we just looked at, then it's an endothermic process. So if, if that's what's wrote on the piece of paper, um, then it's understood that we're talking about the block of ice. So it, if it just says, is this process endothermic or exothermic, all you see is H2O solid and H2O liquid, so that must be what we're referring to, so it would be endothermic, right? Uh, but if it was wrote like this instead, where you were shown everything, the block of ice and the surroundings, and asked if that was, so obviously the block of ice went to a puddle of water, 
And if that, if you asked, is that exothermic or endothermic? Well, now it's a bit more confusing because now you show, now everything is showing uh, the ice and the surroundings. So now you have to know what, what are you asking? Are you asking me if the system, the ice, if it's exothermic or endothermic with respect to that? Or are you asking me other surroundings? Is it endothermic or exothermic with respect to that? Right. So you have to be very specific in this chapter uh, and know what the question is talking about. Is it talking about the system or the surroundings? Okay, so what is heat? So if you had to describe what heat is to somebody, uh, that's not necessarily easy to do uh, because it's not temperature, right? Temperature and heat are two totally different things. So to illustrate it, we'll take a system like this. So let's say we have two containers um, and they both have gas in them and one's at a high temperature. Uh, let's say it's 100 degrees Celsius, for example. And so the left is at 100 and let's say the right one is at a lower temperature. So let's, let's say it's at 50 degrees Celsius. So it's full of gas. So the gas molecules are just moving around right in random directions moving in straight lines until they hit something then then they bounce off right and go on a straight line in a different direction so you set these two set systems up they're next to each other um separated by a wall and then you go away and you come back some come back sometime later so what would you expect to find sometime later well you would expect to find that now they're at the same temperature So then that would mean the two, the gas molecules in both chambers would be moving at the same speed, right? So, so how did that happen? So obviously the gas molecules on the left slowed down, the ones on the right sped up. So there was a transfer of energy, right? And that flow of energy, so there was a flow of energy from the container on the left to the container on the right. And that flow of energy is heat. So heat is a transfer of energy. Okay, so with respect to the container on the left, is the process endothermic or exothermic? Well, if, if the HN2 molecules slowed down, they must have given some of their energy away. So with respect to the left, the process is exothermic. With respect to the container on the right, uh, the process would be endothermic. Right, so those N2 molecules in blue would have sped up some, so now they're moving a little bit faster, so they must have absorbed energy. So this doesn't really relate to this chapter, but so how, how was energy transferred from the N2 molecules in the left container to the ones on the right? Because they're not in the same container, so they can't bump into each other and transfer energy that way, so how do they transfer energy if they're not in contact with each other? <clears throat> well, there is a wall between them, right? And what is that wall made out of? Well, it doesn't matter what the material is, right? It's The point is it's made out of atoms or molecules because everything is made out of atoms or elements, right? Atoms or molecules. So what happens when the N2 molecules on the left hit the wall is so they would, so the wall of course is solid. So those molecules in, or atoms in the wall are not moving around, but they are vibrating. And so when something hits it, it'll make them vibrate faster. And then when the slow moving N2 molecules on the op opposite side hit that, then some of the energy of vibration in the wall would be transferred to the N2 molecules on the right, and then they would start moving faster. And so energy can be transferred through the wall that way. So if there was nothing in the wall, if there was a vacuum, then energy wouldn't transfer very well. And the two containers would maintain their temperatures better, right? So the one on the left would stay hotter longer and the one on the right would stay colder longer. And of course, you're all familiar with this concept if you've ever used a thermos before because that's how thermos uh, works, right? You have a good insulator between the inside and outside wall so heat can't transfer uh, efficiently between them. Okay, so thermochemical equations. So if we, so we have a chemical reaction root here. And, and delta H is shown. So we have the chemical reaction, and then we have semicolon, delta H is negative 386.6 negative kilojoules. So delta H is negative, so what does that mean? That means this is an exo, it's an exothermic reaction. 
So that means it releases heat, right? So the reaction would be the system and then that heat would be re released to the surroundings, whatever was surrounding in the vicinity of that reaction. <clears throat> so there would be another way. So if, you, if it's wrote like this with a semicolon and delta H, if it's negative, it's axothermic. So there another way to write thermochemical equations though, and that would be to embed the energy within the chemical equation itself. So it could be the, on the right or the left of the arrow. In this, in this case, it's on the uh, right of the arrow. So if it's on the right of the arrow, then you can think of the energy like a product of the reaction. So it's given off. If it's given off, it's exothermic reaction, right? So if the energy is rolled on the right of the, re the arrow, it's an exothermic reaction. So this would be an example of an endothermic reaction. Um, so you have the chemical reaction and then the semicolon and then you have delta H. And then, um, in this case, it's a positive. So if it's positive, that means it's endo. That would be an endothermic reaction. Or the, another way to write it would be to write it like this, where the energy is embedded within the chemical reaction itself. And so in this case, since it's on the left, uh, of the reaction arrow, then that means it's a, you can think of it like a reactant. Um, you need energy plus barium hydroxide and ammonium nitrate for this reaction to work. So that must absorb energy, and so that would be an endothermic reaction. So that means the surroundings would become colder because the, energy, the surroundings would be releasing energy to the reaction so that the reaction could proceed. <clears throat> so you're all familiar with this concept if you've ever used a hot pack or a cold pack before, right? So how do cold packs work? Well, there's a couple of ways. You could put them in the freezer and then they become cold, but that's not what we're talking about here. So there's another way that cold packs work. Um, you can take a cold pack and you can start squishing it and then it becomes cold magically, right? So how does it become cold? Uh, because in that reaction, there were two chemicals that mixed and when those two chemicals mixed, a reaction occurred that absorbed energy. So where is it going to absorb energy from? From the surface of the cold pack. And so it's going to become colder, right? And from whatever else material was inside that cold pack. Or similarly for a hot pack, how does a hot pack work? Hot pack work works a couple of ways, right? You could either take it and stick it in the microwave and warm it up that way, but that's not what we're talking about. Another way to take it would be to take the hot pack and squish it up, and then it becomes hot all of a sudden. So what's going on then? Well, you have two, you have chemicals that are reacting with each other that gives off energy in the process, and so it's exothermic. Where does that energy go? Well, it goes to the surface of the hot pack, so you touch it, and it becomes hot, and then it, and then it escapes to the air around the hot pack and so forth. So this is a similar concept to how airbags work. How does an airbag work in a car? Well, there's a, chemicals in there that are separated by a barrier and when in an impact that barrier breaks and chemicals mix and the chemical reaction produces a gas and it produces a lot of gas really fast and that gas fills up the airbag. So it's simply uh, a chemical reaction that produces gas in this case rather than uh, heat or absorbing or giving off heat. Although it may also absorb or give off heat, but it gives off a gas and that's how it fills the airbag. Okay, so let's do some calculations with these thermochemical equations. <clears throat> so you have this equation wrote like this. So how do you interpret that? How do you interpret delta H? So it's negative 368.6 kilojoules, so you know it's an exothermic, uh, but it produces this much energy per how much sodium? For how much water? <clears throat> well, the way that you interpret that is that it produces uh, this much energy per this much sodium and this much water. And what are these numbers here? These are molar ratios, right? So negative 368.6 kilojoules per two moles of sodium and negative 368.6 kilojoules per two moles of water. So the energy in the equation relates to the molar coefficients in the reaction. <clears throat>
Okay, so what if we had this reaction? So same reaction, same chemical, sodium and water to make sodium hydroxide and H2. But what if this is eight and eight? So instead of two and two, it's eight and eight. So that's quadrupled. And then of course, this would be quadrupled and that would be quadrupled as well, right? So two sodium hydroxide is now eight and one H2 is now four. Well, so what would delta H be for this reaction? It would simply be, say, take the delta H in the original equation, negative 368.6 kilojoules, and you quadrupled it. You quadrupled the number of moles, which means you had to quadruple delta H too. So however you, much you change the stoichiometry by, you have to change delta H by the same amount. If you double the stoichiometry, you double delta H. If you triple it, you triple delta H. If you half it, you half delta, you cut delta H in half. So this would be 368.6 times four. So if you took eight moles of sodium and eight moles of water and reacted them, to produce eight moles of sodium hydroxide and four moles of H2 gas, that would produce 1,474.4 kilojoules of energy exothermic that would be released to the surroundings. <clears throat> okay, so whatever you do to the stoichiometry, you do the same thing to delta H. Okay, so what if the reaction is given to you like this? So same reaction, uh, but what if you have, the reaction tells you you start with 10 grams of sodium. <clears throat> So how much energy would be released if you only had 10 grams of sodium? So how do you do that? Well, the first thing you have to do is convert this grams to moles. All right, so 10 grams of sodium. So you have to look up the periodic table and, and calculate the molar mass. So one mole of sodium is 22.9898 grams of sodium. So that's the inverse of the molar mass, right? So 10 divided by 22.9898, so 0.4349 moles of sodium. And so now if we go back to the thermochemical equation, it's that much energy is produced for every two moles of sodium, right? It's this much energy per this much moles of sodium. Right? But you only have 0.4349 moles of sodium because you only have 10 grams. So this is two moles of sodium. Okay, so moles of sodium cancel. So if we just calculate this out. So that would be negative 80.2 kilojoules. So 10 grams of sodium. And if you had the stoichiometric amount um, of H2O to react it with, that reaction would release 80.2 kilojoules of energy. Mm. Okay, so lastly, so the same reaction um, <clears throat> that we've been working with before, just to show you other ways that you can manipulate a thermochemical equation, and then what do you do to delta H if you make a change to the equation? <clears throat> so in this case, so if you notice B, so B is just the reverse of A. So if we took this reaction and it ran in reverse, so two NaOH plus one H2 reacted, if it reacted to make two Na plus two H2O, so if you run the rea reaction in reverse, basically what all you have to do is change the sign. All right, so if you re reverse a reaction's direction, delta H is opposite in sign. <clears throat> So that doesn't mean that the reaction would go in reverse, but if it did go in reverse, then delta H would be, instead of being exothermic, it would be endothermic by the same amount. <clears throat> okay, so if we compare A to C, <clears throat> so what's the difference? Um, if what's the difference between A and C? Well, as we've cut this, we've cut the moles in half, right? So we went from two to one, and we went from uh, not quite. This should be not one half. This should be one. Oh, what in the world? I think I have the same. What did I do here? NaOHH two to make sodium H two O. So B is fine. What did I do? Oh, 
I see what I've done. Okay, so what about C? So C is reversed and it's cut in half, right? We can see that if we just compare um, B to C. So B and C are in the same direction, um, <clears throat> but everything is cut in half. So we went from two to one, so one to one half, two to one, and two to one. So C is the same direction as B, uh, but everything is cut in half, so we would just take the three, 68.6 and divide it by 2. So this would be positive 184.3 kilojoules of energy, right? So if we compare it A to C, then we, we reversed it and cut it in half. <clears throat> Okay, so that's the main point. So thermochemical equations, if you reverse reactions, just change the sign. If you change the stoichiometry, um, multiply delta H by the same fraction that you change the stoichiometry by. Okay, we will stop there.